I'm Shani Thier. I'm the director of the Maison Française, the French house at Columbia University. And I am deeply honored to welcome our special guest today, Mathieu Ricard, who has agreed to, uh, kindly agreed to join us for a conversation about the journey from personal transformation to social change. So thank you so much, Mathieu, for giving us the gift of your time. And um, I want to- <laughs> And I want to welcome Fanny Gay as well, who's my deputy at the French House, and she's going to be joining me as, as a co-moderator in this discussion with, with Mathieu. We'll also save some time at the end of the hour for questions from the audience. So if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen in English or in French, or perhaps even in Tibetan. Um, we would leave it up to Mathieu to read it <laughs> if it's in Tibetan. And before we, we begin, I just want to say a, a few words of introduction for, for our audience. So Mathieu Ricard was born and raised in France, and he was first trained as a scientist and earned a PhD in cell genetics in 1972 and did some research at the Pasteur Institute in Paris. And he made his first trip to India in 1967, and that was the beginning of a, of a journey that has lasted um, a, a lifetime. And he decided to move back there in the early 70s and has been living in the Himalayan region ever since. Since then, he's devoted his life to the study and practice of Buddhism, following the teachings of the greatest Tibetan spiritual masters of our time. And he's also served as the French interpreter for the Dalai Lama since 1989 and has translated a number of texts from the Buddhist language into French and English. Mathieu Ricard is also a remarkable photographer, and we have the pleasure of sharing some of your, your photographs um, in a moment, and the author of a number of works about Buddhism, about meditation, about happiness, and altruism, and compassion, among other topics. And also his unique background as a French-trained scientist and uh, a Buddhist practitioner has enabled him to join in conversations and scientific studies and publish a number of books and articles about the, um, what we can understand from the interaction between uh, understandings and insights about mind and consciousness stemming from the Buddhist tradition that's more than 2000 years old and more recent findings about mind and consciousness in neuroscience. So he's uh, been involved in a number of conversations and published books, including this one called Beyond the Self. Uh, that's a conversation with, between Mathieu and Wolf Singer, who's a, a neuroscientist. Many of Mathieu's books have been translated into English, um, including more recently this wonderful book called Freedom for All of Us, which is a uh, conversation with Christophe André and Alexandre Joliat, and another book called A Plea for the Animals, also recently published in English. So I encourage you to, to read some of these books. And um, uh, he's also a very well-known speaker, has been speak invited to speak a number of times at the World Forum in Davos, and has several talks on, on TED that have been viewed, I think, seven million times or more. So we're especially honored to have you joining us for this more, um, this more sorry, intimate, for this more intimate conversation, <laughs> along with phone interruptions. Um, so, uh, thank you so much for joining us from, from Dordogne in France, where you've, uh, waded through flooded streets to get to a house that has a better Wi-Fi connection. So we're, we're really pleased that you could join us. I just want to mention one more thing, which is that Mathieu is also the founder of a, uh, a humanitarian association named Karuna Sejen that's based on the ideal of compassion in action. And it develops educational, medical, and social projects for communities in the Himalayan region. We've put a link in the chat box. So if you want to find out more about this organization and perhaps make a gift as a form of Dana for, for Mathieu's time today, that would be most appreciated. So thank you, Mathieu Ricard, so much for joining us. And I am going Welcome. to, uh, I'm going to um, turn over to Fanny to ask the first set of questions. Thank you. Bonsoir, Mathieu. Thank you so much. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> um, since last year um so I, i'm gonna start about beginnings <laughs> and um since last year we have um, experienced a lot of sufferings uh, death of loved ones sickness job loss and um students 
uh, not only students, but especially students are facing isolation and an an anxiety about their future. And uh, as Shani mentioned, you were a PhD student um, in biology when you first went to India. And I would like to, you to reflect a little bit about that period of your life. Um, and I have a, a few questions, um, um, starting by, did you know at that time uh, what you were looking for? And uh, did you have some kind of guides, um, model figures uh, for this journey? I'm also wondering, why did you choose um, Tibetan Buddhism? Um, over other forms of uh, sp spirituality. And um, my idea with those questions is to ask you for advice. Uh, what would you say to young people uh, who are seeking for a meaning of life today? Yes. Thank you so much, Fanny. So, obviously, the usual questioning that often teenagers and young people ask themselves, you know, what should I do with my life? <laughs> and that's not a minor question. And for some of them is even more dramatic. I think one of the most dramatic questions I ever heard in my life was in Hong Kong after a, a small gathering where I was giving a little talk. Then from the back of the audience, a, a young person, maybe, I don't know, 20, 25, got up and said, can you give me a reason, one reason why I should, I should stay alive? Now, what can you say? I mean, of course, uh, you have to first uh, be very humble. Uh, you cannot, there's no ready-made answer for such a question. But even it's not as dramatic, but unfortunately, you know, quite a few people ask themselves that question. But so even at a less degree, you know, you really want to do something for which it's really, really what you want to do. But before that, you need to identify something. So that shows that both a sense of direction and meaning is obviously a major factor. And all the more when we need to cross uh, adversity. Uh, for instance, uh, if you walk in the Himalayas, you know, it can be absolutely magnificent. I mean, you are in a state of total exhilaration. But sometimes also, you know, there's hail and altitude sickness, and you go, you think you're already there, but you have to go down all the way valley and come up again. So, you know, discouragement may set in place. But if you know you are on the right track, even if it's long, even if it's difficult, there's a kind of joy in the form of effort. Every step brings you closer to a beautiful lake a monastery, visiting a spiritual master or something. But if you get lost suddenly, there's mist, you don't know where to go. So you sit on a stone there and, and then the whole weight of exhaustion, disorientation sets in, despair. Why should I go here or there? Because I don't know if it's getting me further away or closer. So not to have this sense of direction and not to have a sense of meaning is very crucial. So I remember very well, of course, I had a very interesting uh, youth and, and adolescence um, because I was the son of a French philosopher. My mother is a, is a painter. She's 90, almost 98 now. And uh, we had a lot of intellectuals of that time coming to our home, you know, famous painters and artists and musicians and so forth. But at the same time as a teenager, I was watching all that. And it was very hard to say, you know, I wanted to to have the, the particular skill or genius of, of one of these great pianists or this great, the mind of that great mathematician or write, you know, like this, this poet, but I would not necessarily want to be like them. You know, I used to play chess and Bobby Fischer was the superstar and one of the greatest genius of chess. But as a person, he was completely, you know, pathetic and messed up. And, so you would not want to become like him, but you wanted to play chess like him. So it was very uh, disconcerting. And also even in my science, I knew what I didn't want my life to be, which is boring, meaningless, but I, I didn't want, I didn't know yet what, where I wanted to go exactly. 
So this is when, uh, and of course, I remember in Canada once I met a group of, of young people, about 20, and they said, you know, we went, we finished our, our, our college and everything. We went, to, we fill up a lot of questionnaires about orientation, and we try a few things, but we just basically don't know what will be good for us and to make a, a good life, so flourishing life, good for myself, good for others. So I told them, well, you know, instead of computing things and filling things in the computer, why don't you go, you know, Canada is a beautiful country to some beautiful place and sit there and just don't try to make too much, uh, you know, Disc discursive thinking. See if something comes at the surface. That's what I really, really would like to do. And then, as we said, when there's a will, there's a way. So I think to find a sense of direction is very important. And at this time, when many people have been confined, where they think they're wasting their time, where they say they can't see their friend at the age where the, you know, the richness of human relationship is so important to grow and to find new opportunity, new people to have a, a, a good, a rich emotional life, of course it's disconcerting. At the same time, you know, if we don't, if we keep the sense of meaning, you know, there have been worse than that, I must say. <laughs> you know, if you were living in India uh, mid uh, last century, you know, basically like in the 20th century, 400 million people died of, of, uh, of, of smallpox. That's four times two world wars together. No, it's zero because of the, thanks to the vaccination. And so we still live at a time where we are not used anymore to catastrophes. And we, we told that we have, we, we extracted ourselves out of nature. We dominated nature, which, and of course, a, this little organism of a one tenth of thousands of a millimeter comes back to say, well, not quite. <laughs> So again, it's also for young people, I think it's a, it's a comforting message that something needs to be done about the general condition of the way we interfere with the planet. So this is a, a foreboding of possibly much greater crisis due to the environment. And they know that more and more. So voices like, you know, of young people become more and more important, like Greta Thunberg, or Thunberg of course, did a big splash saying that how you dare to sacrifice our generation. So, and if you look at it very briefly, all the great epidemics the links to virus in the last 30 years, you know, starting from, from AIDS and Ebola and the SARS and the swine flu and the avian flu and all those were either, uh, you know, completely crazy industrial farming in condition that has nothing to do with anything natural and leading to epidemics and so forth, or encroaching so much into wildlife habitats and that then you get this uh, unhealthy interaction with other species. So this is all of them. You can look carefully. They came from unhealthy relationship to other species. So the eight, odd, eight million other species on earth. So this is a long discourse to say that of course, then we need to find inner resources. We need to build up the inner resources to deal with the ups and downs of life. And that's basically why, uh, you know, when I left uh, France, what I was looking for, and I, thanks to a documentary made from one of my friends, Arnaud Desjardins, it's called The Message of the Tibetans. He filmed a great Tibetan master who had fled the Chinese invasion of Tibet in the late 50s. And there were, there were 20 Socrates, 20 San Francisco of Assisi alive today. And I thought, okay, I'm going there. I was 21 and I did go. And I, I met remarkable masters like Kangyu Ramoshe and others. And there, the big difference. You know, I have not so, in, at priori, I, I didn't know much about Buddhism. So it's not their skills or their knowledge. It was what they were as a person. So I thought if I can become even a little bit of the co human quality and even further spiritual quality, maybe what that person represents and is the living example 
the messenger becoming the message, that will be worth. So then I got a sense of direction. This is a kind of real role model, not uh, what I've seen so far. So in a nutshell, I think what's really important is to find role model among people we truly admire for human qualities, and then oneself find a way that we feel that every if we do if we follow a certain way, every moment of life will be worth living. And then when you look back 20 years, 30 years, you say, well, that was a good thing I did to choose that path. <laughs> Sorry for this long answer. Uh, thank you very much. You jump a little bit to the, the, the next question, I think. Uh, but <laughs> thank you very much for this panorama uh, and, and, and the, the, the answer about your, your the beginnings. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so yes. much. And, and um, Agnes, I will I will follow up with some some additional questions about your thoughts on the the global pandemic and the environmental crisis more generally. You you talked about the fact that one thing in common among these viruses that have that have uh, become pandemics in in the past years is the connection to our treatment of the environment and of animals in in particular. And I just wondered if you have any additional insights about um, that you can bring from, from Buddhism to your understanding of the causes of the pandemic and, um, and what it shows us about the nature of reality and the nature of our connections between individuals and other people, other species and nature. Do you, you know? Do you do you think that Buddhism can bring particular insights about how to understand what what's happened and why and how to respond? Hmm. Recently, I found some articles by French philosophers, and uh, they are sort of discovered interdependence as a big thing. <laughs> I thought that was quite hilarious. You know, they basically had noticed over the years that there is a real uh, how do you say? Very few, uh, except if they are specialists of the, of the East, but very few Western, maybe a little bit more now, but not so much until recently, Western philosopher, thinkers, uh, think that uh, anything else has been never done interesting <laughs> outside the you know, Western world. I know the concept of interdependence is central to Buddhism for like 2,500 years. And uh, it says that as absolutely nothing that is uh, existing in the universe as a completely independent entity. Something that will be fully autonomous, that means, means what? It means it doesn't interact with anything else. So it basically doesn't belong to this universe because all the infinite uh, mesh of, uh, of uh, cause and effect and condition and circumstances are infinitely interacting uh, you know, even, I mean, Ernst Mark, who found the principle of inertia, when you push a car, you know, in the beginning it's very hard, and then when it takes momentum, it's become easier. He said that the whole universe is a sort of uh, interacts to create that inertia. The only way you can explain is the presence of the universe. So, yes, everything is interdependent. And then if you look at... Uh, uh, especially in the you know, development Matthew, it looks like you're frozen. Um, let's see, let's hope that it resolves. I don't know if you can hear us, but your image is frozen and we can't hear you. Okay, now we see you and you're moving again. So okay. we lost the last minute. Oh, fantastic. So. If you don't mind repeating yourself. Oh, I say, well, I don't know where I, uh, where, where did I, could you tell me, you don't well, wear something, uh, one hint? Yeah, you were talking about. Well, anyway. Recovery of know, interdependence and, in, and quantum physics interaction means. and the idea of, a, of an accelerating car. Yeah, so anyway, the idea of interdependence is also connected with the idea that everything there's nothing that is completely local or independent. And quantum physics now, one of the great discovery of the last 30 years, you know, thanks to John Bell and a physician like Alain Aspect and Nicolas Gisin and, and others, is basically that uh, reality is not local. 
is it's basically global. So therefore, yes, everything is connected. So that means also uh, that if we want to solve global problem, we need to do it uh, as a, as together, not just like nations' interests, because it is everyone' interest. It's, uh, we're either all winners or all losers. There's no such thing as competition that makes any sense when facing the issue of the environment. So that's typically the area, but also world poverty and many other, you know, you know, basically flourishing in life to have enough access to education and everything. This is something that should be absolutely of global interest. And the biodiversity, obviously everything is connected. So if we want to preserve that uh, for the next generations, then we need, as the Dalai Lama says, non-violence toward human, non-violence toward animals, other species, and non-violence toward the environment because of the notion of we are all interconnected. So that's a very, very central concept from Buddhism that is so relevant, not because it's a dogma that happens to fit with our problem, but because Buddhism philosophy has been always to bridge the gap between appearance and, rea and reality. So if it's just a dogma that says something about something that doesn't fit with reality, we don't, there's no use. So it's an investigation about reality. And once you have found, for instance, that things are in the, in, interdependent, then what does that imply for yourself? That means you cannot be a dead selfish, thinking I can build my happiness in the little bubble of my self-identity, because that would suppose that you could do that theoretically. You're enough separated from others that you could build your happiness in your little corner. But that doesn't work. It's dysfunctional because we are so interconnected. So the only way to achieve happiness is with and through others, through benevolence, through compassion, through altruism. So then the twofold benefit of others and yourself are accomplished. Because also it works because you are attuned to reality. Mm -hmm. So that's why understanding interdependence is also the basis for altruism and compassion, not only for humans, but for all species, all sentient beings and animals, of course, are sentient. That's it. <laughs> that was that was really excellent. A great, a great answer to a really big question. And just to follow up just a little bit longer. Um, so understanding this notion of independence and seeing it played out in a very concrete way, we, we, you know that if you don't take care of the health of your neighbor or of your neighbors in another country, then it, it has a direct impact on your own health. So there, we can't think about um, the health of ourselves as being separate from the health of, of others. Um, so, so continue that's that logic. Yes, that's, sorry, sorry that's stupid. No, that's, that's please why. go on, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, that's all right. No, I was just going to ask No, you. I was just saying that this is the... Yes. No, go ahead. <laughs> that's typically about the, vac the, the, the resistance to vaccination that I think France is one of the countries that is as more hesitant about that. But as it has been said, until we are all safe, nobody is safe. So that's typically when I hear people, no, oh, I don't like this, I don't want to get it. I say, well, maybe for yourself, you can do whatever you like. But please think of others. Then you become a, a vector for perpetuating something that is harmful for others. So even you don't care, do it for others. So I think it seems to be very straightforward. Yes, and that applies so much in the United States where not only is there a resistance to the vaccine among some people, but there's a resistance to mask wearing in the name of individual freedom. You, you can't make me abandon my freedom and wear a mask. But, but your freedom is not independent from the freedom and rights to, to health of other people. So um, we've definitely seen these, these issues. Well, you know, a, a psychologist, which I met, I met once in Australia at the happiness conference, and, and I studied their work to do, when I wrote the book on altruism, is Jen Twingy, and she wrote a book on the body, it's called the Epid Narcissism Epidemic. And so if you only think me, me, me all day long, of course, you want to show that you can do anything you want and who cares, you know? And, uh, you know, I heard once on, on, the, on the American channel that everyone knows, which I will not name, uh, a, a great uh, American billionaire speaking about the race of the ocean. And that was not, that was even before they start denying everything. 
that was uh, 10 years ago, we already had signs of the raise of the level of the ocean. And he said something that's uh, incredible in my mind. He said about when you were said that maybe in 100 years, suppose the ocean will be one, one meter higher or more, who knows? He said, you know, I find absurd to change my life and behavior today for something that happens in 100 years. So maybe this guy had no children, no grandchildren. He thinks just after me, never mind. So that's, you know, I'm a fan of Groucho Marx. Everyone knows in America, I'm less in France. And that's my favorite Marxist, by the way. And he said, why should I care for future generation? What did they do for me? So that's basically <laughs> what those people are saying, you know. But they're saying seriously, which is very, very, very which is tragic. Yeah, they're not joking. Um, so, um, so, so one, just one tiny follow-up question, then we'll go back to Fanny, who's going to ask you about your photography. So, uh, if we take this understanding of the concept of inter interdependence to help us understand what has happened and why, um, how how can Buddhism help us think about what the appropriate responses are to the situation we find ourselves in today, with the pandemic, with you know economic collapse, with environmental catastrophe? What would a Buddhist sort of um, list of remedies <laughs> for how to how to move forward from here of course there's no it would be a very arrogant to say we are buddhists have a magic bullet but but there are two levels of course maybe multi-level but at least two individual and societal mm -hmm. so individual again you know you, there's two things first yourself you have to uh sort of keep your sanity of mind so that's so important then to build up the, or to cultivate, let's say, the build up is a little bit too forceful, to cultivate the inner human qualities and that will help us deal with whatever comes in one's life in a health, more healthy way. So one of my friends, Richard Davidson, founded the Center for Healthy Minds in Medicine. And they are studying what are the factors that makes a healthy mind. So a healthy mind is a mind that has some freedom inside, that is spacious, uh, that has a degree of resilience, uh, that is not me, me, me all day long, which makes a very uncomfortable situation. Why me? Why not me? But which is uh, also very open to others, benevolent. A priori, you just want everyone to find happiness and be free from suffering. Why not wishing that a priori? Why from the beginning say, I hate this kind of group, I don't like those people. Why not wishing everyone who wakes up in the morning not thinking I may I suffer the whole day, why that wish may not come true? Why not wishing may everyone find happiness and the cause of happiness? So developing those inner quality will give an incredible sort of resilience as an individual. Now, globally, we need to show more cooperation, you know, comp uh, compassion, altruism, benevolence. That's the only way we can get out. This complete sort of individualistic selfishness is a self-destructing concept. I think the French writer, Romain Roland, who's not particularly a Buddhist, although I think he had some little interest, said, if selfish happiness is the only goal of your life, your life will soon be goalless without any goal because it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, we need to become a better human being. And at the same time that that improvement or that becoming a better human being should be also uh, such that you become a better person toward others. Otherwise it does not work. It's a twofold accomplishment of others flourishing and your own flourishing. It's a win-win situation. Selfishness is a lose-lose situation. You make yourself unhappy, you make everyone unhappy. So, basically both for inner sort of serenity and joy, as well as you know, being a good person in the society, I think basing things on benevolence give you an incredible strength of resilience and to go through ups and downs of life. Thank you, that's, that's excellent advice and um... So we're, Fanny now, I think, has some questions for you about your photography and is going to share some of your photographs. Mm. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, there is a good transition from benevolence to beauty <laughs> uh, for a healthy mind. And um, I wanted to, to talk a little bit more about your work as a photographer. Um, I will try to share Um, yeah, uh, some photographer. <laughs> Why it's not working? <laughs> yep. Take your time. Well, I can say a few words while you try to do it. And you know, when you say about the link, yes. So before you show, while you show the, why tr please try to show the image. In the meantime, I will say a few words, <laughs> give you a relief. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's a, there is a very natural transition because uh, recently I did a book on wonderment. And so wonderment about the, uh, the, 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 the nature, the beauty of nature. Maybe you can show the one before or, re or after. Yes, oh, just before, okay. So when you, you know, this is what I see from my little hermitage in the Himalaya. So it's about three meters by three, I mean nine square feet. But you see what I can see. I see the world basically. So it doesn't matter if it's very small inside. <laughs> from my balcony, that's what I see at six in the morning. And it's about 150 miles away. That's one of the Annapurna two. So this, you know, this is huge. This is 24,000 feet. So the wonderment, you cannot but feel wonderment when you see that. And wonderment is something that is about something bigger than yourself. And this very beautiful study by Dashiell Keltner is a psychologist disciple of a uh, student of Paul Ekman, my great friend. And he showed that also when you feel wonderment because it's a little bit less self-centered, you become more altruistic. So that's really wonderful. When you feel wonderment, say it, looking at this kind of scenery, then of course you want, you want to respect what is uh, an object of wonder. Uh, you're not going to destroy what you uh, feel find in awe of in front of. And then if you respect something, you want to, you care for it. And therefore, if you care for it, you are ready to act to protect it. So I think the uh, wonderment in, in the face of the beauty of nature, of animals, and also human beings is a, is a very great positive and constructive way of caring for others, caring for the environment. So you can show the next slide, please. So in photography, I also wanted to show the, uh, to give back hope and confidence in the beauty of human nature. When you see this image of my first teacher, Kangyu Rinpoche, mm -hmm. there's nothing but goodness and wisdom emanating from this image. So you can see that we all have a potential for goodness that might be hidden deep within. Once I went to a high security jail in France and they say, you know, we are here for years and years. And it's not like in the state where they kill people or keep them for life, but usually they are at least there for 25 years when they have commit murders or something. So they keep on, they say, okay, we are here for some part, biggest part of our life. We did something terrible. And on top of that, we think also that human nature is bad. So what a gloomy, uh, you no, know, how can we spend the rest of our life with any peace? So when I spoke to them and explained them about this notion of the innate goodness, you know, we call Buddha nature in Buddhism, that there is something, even you did something terrible, which is like a nugget of gold that is deep within, that is the fundamental nature of our consciousness. And that shines through this portrait of Kongyu Rinpoche. And then this can be as fallen in the mud, in the worst disgusting thing, but you can pick it up, you can wash it, you can make it shine again. And the gold itself, even it was hidden in the mud, it, it's, the gold itself had never lost is quality, it has never been degraded. It was simply hidden or sort of a potential. So we should find out that potential for oneself. So to, to show the beautiful aspect of human beings is another choice I made with photography 
uh, I've seen scenes of suffering. And so this is my second teacher, Iko Kensei Rinpoche. This is the Dalai Lama, uh, where this was pretty fast. <laughs> meeting with the young, uh, okay. So <laughs> through smiles or through spiritual beings uh, to give back the confidence that yes, there is beauty inside human nature. And beauty is not like the Greek criteria or Hollywood, Hollywood criteria or Bollywood criteria of, of beauty. It's the beauty that comes from goodness, the beauty that comes from compassion, the beauty that comes from kindness. So that's the kind of beauty that is, is good forever, whether young or old, it doesn't make any difference. Beauty of the heart, okay? So you're one. you're um, you're doing you you're, you're taking some photograph to show beauty to others. That's how I understand what you're saying. That well, that's, that's that's the role of photography. Yes, yeah, so that's that's one way. Hmm. Well, you know, I mean, I have many friends who have been war correspondents, and we need to show you know massacres and famine to raise consciousness. But that's a different thing. But there's so many of those. And I remember uh, being an, having an ex exhibition in a fair for photojournalism in France it was called the Visa pour l'image, which is very famous about photojournalism. And there was 35 exhibits. And there was only two that are a little bit positive. The rest was the mafia in, in, uh, in Sicily, the drug uh, problem in Brooklyn or the Kosovo war at the time. And you know, you just such a terrible picture of human nature. So you can think that you know the wicked world syndrome that world is bad, man is bad, so there's no hope. So you need to show that there is hope, of course, and there's potential. So this little girl, uh, there's a Tibetan doctor taking her pulse, and also for us, she became our Karuna girl because, I, as you mentioned in the beginning, we started Karuna means compassion in Sanskrit. So we started an organization called Karuna Session, and now it's 20 years this year. So now we are helping more than 300,000 people every year in India, Northern India, Nepal, and Tibet. And we're also starting in Europe a little bit to do some social work. So in, in field of education, uh, health, and social, social empowerment, and women empowerment especially. So again, this is also putting compassion in action, and I can also use photography uh, to show that. And, uh, this little girl was so sweet. Now I went back uh, eight years after and, and told her there's another portrait where uh, we, we put on all our brochure, which is so cute. And I, I showed that to her when she has grown up and said, look, with the, this photo has been seen by hundreds of thousands of people. And she looked at me and said, this guy is completely nuts. Why should anyone look at my photo? So I took another portrait and uh, it's, I don't think it's here, but so I have this little bit like, you know, Steve Macquarie, Afghan girl. So I have my uh, little Tibetan girl uh, 10 years later and she, she became even very beautiful. So there's a uh, uh, monks, uh, Thai monks uh, walking on the, on, the, on the ruins of Nalanda University. And that used to be a, one of the biggest ever university in the world. There is 20, more than 20, 30,000 uh, students were studying Buddhist philosophy in Northern India. Uh, and so it disappeared because of the, some uh, Muslim conquerors at that time. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the thing is that there was a, a fantastic library as well. So this is, uh, was to be, so that's also what I see from my hermitage. So you see the serenity of the place. So um, uh, I left uh, in May because um, I have a 97 years old mother, so to take care of her, but normally that's where I stay. And so I'm a bit longing to go back to the Himalayas, but uh, the conditions are not quite right right now. I hope to be there soon. Um, and 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 I, I especially like this one. I I I, I feel a lot of joy. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, the joy is uh, is uh, is really uh, meaningful because that was you know you see on the back the ruins of monastery, so five thousand eight hundred monastery. That's eight ninety five percent of monasteries in Tibet were destroyed during the Cultural Revolution of Communist China and the following years. And monks were put in, in labor camps like the Uyghur today. So the, many of them spend, of those you can see here, spend 15, 20 years in labor camps. 
And in the 80s, that's in 1985, when my second teacher, Kensele Moshe, Diko Kensele Moshe, went back to Tibet after 30 years in exile. So he is like the sun shining again for them. No any great spiritual master had ever come back to India in Eastern Tibet at that time. So the car of Kensele Moshe had just passed and they are rushing with those white scarves to offer him with such a joy that uh, you know, their teacher has come back after 30 years. And so even you look very close in this photo, every, every face is sort of beaming with uh, such relief and joy, yes. Uh, uh, and it's a beautiful color photo as well. <laughs> and I, I will just, um, because time is flying, uh, just uh, mention. Well, that's a, oh, okay. Okay. You wanted to go back to this one? No, no. This is also from my hermitage. So I, I, I'm look. I'm in the sky, but actually I'm just sitting the, at, above my hermitage. Um, I will just okay. Stop sharing. Maybe we can come back later. But time is is flying, and and uh, Shania has another question, important one about. Uh, Compassion. Okay, very good. So, thank you so much. Those are beautiful photographs. And just maybe before we move on, can you tell our members of our audience where we can see more of your photographs? Um, I think there are a few books that have been published, but only in French and not yet in English. Is that right? Of well, uh, there's 12, 12 books in French, but I think there's at least uh, five or six in English. In, uh, there is a web photographs? Yeah, there's a Buddhist Himalaya, there's, there's a spirit of Tibet, there's Bhutan, land of serenity, there's motionless journey, uh, there's quite a few. Yeah, Tibet, uh, what is it, compassionate eyes or something like that. And then um, what else? Yes, uh, you can see that there's a website, that's my name, I could not avoid that, so it is easy identification. <laughs> and also I, I, mm, there is a wonderful, um, artist who is uh, printing the photos and you can find it's called photo buy and buy is not buying is by dot fr photo by dot fr so she uh, she exhibit those photos and also on on the so-called the website that my friends are made uh, is uh, with my name there's a like, photo galleries as well and I, I believe someone i mean i don't use i don't use social media but they said that they put most of them on instagram Whatever it is. I just share the link to your website so that. Um, okay, Gr great. And then in the website, there is a link to this, this uh, artist who does the prints and also has a lot of photos to show. Okay, so um, I wanted yes. to ask you some questions about, about happiness. And um, you've, you've already, I think, in some of your earlier comments, addressed this question to some extent, but, but I'll just come back to it to ask you a little bit more. You've, you've sometimes been called the happiest man in the world. Um, and for people wow. who aren't, <laughs> this surprises you. I'm sure you knew that you, that <laughs> you have some competition. Well, I mean, anyway, uh, let's say among the happiest no, no, but, you know, people in the world. Um, no, 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 but think five seconds, okay. Yeah. You have a, I'm sure you have a, a university speak. Think five seconds about the methodology to find that. How, how can anyone with a straight mind think that among 8 billion human beings, they can find out? First, there's no way to measure happiness. It's certainly not in the brain. So what, what, is, what does that make no sense? This is the biggest joke in the world, I promise. <laughs> I guess it's a good way to sell TED Talks, if nothing else. In any case, so let's well, say you're among the happiest people in the world. Um, well, and, uh, who knows? <laughs> who knows? Um, no, there's no way to, to scientifically prove that, that's for sure. But in any case, uh, my question has to do with um, the link between you know, personal happiness and, and social happiness, I guess. So for, for people who maybe don't know as much about, about Buddhism or about meditation practice, um, it could seem like meditation, for example, is is self-centered or or selfish. You're you're focusing on your own happiness. You're focusing on a sense of inner peace, and um, maybe you know not paying attention to what's going on in the, in the outside world because you're so focused on yourself. So how can you you know how can you 
talk more about the links between inner personal happiness and, and um, certain kind of qualities, inner qualities that one would want to develop, such as compassion well, and, and loving kindness, yes, and, uh, and the larger yeah. world, social change. What's the connection? Well, first that comes from a huge misunderstanding, because as I briefly mentioned, if you think that you are going to find, succeed in looking happiness just for yourself, this is a guaranteed failure. <laughs> it's not going to work because it's not the way you become happy by thinking me, me, me. I know, I think those names are wrong. Like you find books on self-help or self-develop or personal development. Mm -hmm. I mean, this would be altruistic development because otherwise you will never be happy. You will just, you, will just, uh, you know, go round and round in the empty land of selfishness. So there's nothing happened, nothing good to find there. It doesn't work simply. So I think uh, we need to identify uh, what are the inner factors. Of course, we, we should work, improve the outer condition as much as we can. Remedy to poverty in the midst of plenty, you know, stop selling weapons all over the world. You know, improving the status of woman, of the child, and all these things, 100% we should do it. Yet, we vastly neglect the fact that our control of the outer condition, and we see that with the pandemics, is very limited, is uh, ephemeral, because we think we are in charge and nothing and things change, and they are illusory very often. So we cannot bet that we'll keep our situation that the you know, when the pandemic came, obviously everything got, got upside down. So, but with inner condition, at least you can do something because the state of mind can eclipse, override outer condition. You can feel miserable in a little paradise and you can keep your sense of inner health, inner freedom, inner strength, compassion, even in the face of adversity. So that's the whole point about mind training and meditation is about mind training. So when you say selfish, it really doesn't make sense because especially in Buddhist meditation, one of the main goal is to get rid of selfishness. So how can getting rid of selfishness could be selfish? Because that's the main obstacle to happiness. So it cannot be selfish because all you are trying to do is get rid of that, <laughs> that devilish, uh, you know, excessive, exacerbated feeling of self-importance and self-centeredness. So of course it's not getting in the cocoon of individualistic narcissists of uh, well-being, trying to make again the little comfort in your little individualistic world. It's about breaking the shell of that self-centeredness. So definitely it's not selfish. It's actually the, the, the royal highway of flourishing is about benevolence, altruistic love, compassion, and so forth. So that's what we need to find out and it's not rocket science. You know, if we make a weekend or people do seminars, you know, like say, we guarantee 100% that at the end of the weekend, you will be 100% more jealous and 100% more arrogant and 100% more hateful. Who will come? Maybe some of those, uh, you know, uh, conspiracy theorists or something, I don't know, but no one in their right mind will ever come. So if you say, okay, we'll, we'll slowly show you a way that you can become more, altru more benevolent, you know, more at peace with yourself and others. You know, people say, wow, that sounds interesting. So happiness as a way of flo thriving, flourishing, as a way of being, not at the pursuit, another big mistake. People think, sometimes people think happiness is an endless succession of pleasant experiences. You know what is that? It's a recipe for exhaustion, not for happiness. <laughs> so happiness, because this is of course changing all the time. You know, with one ice cream, great, two ice cream, okay, 10 ice cream, you get sick. Most beautiful music, 24 hours is torture. They use it in Guantanamo to torture people like constant music day and night. Mm -hmm. So pleasurable sensation change into neutral and opposite. You can be very selfish while feeling some physical pleasure and so forth. So happiness is not, I mean, nothing wrong with, with genuine healthy pleasures, but it's, it's a different thing. Happiness is a way of being. It's a cluster of basic human qualities, like inner freedom, inner joy, inner resilience and uh, compassion and so forth, which together makes a way of being 
like the place where you stand in life, your baseline, uh, that is basically meaningful, where you feel that every instant is worth living. So that's kind of genuine happiness, not just, uh, just sens sensation. So that's kind of also a very important thing. And I think my friend Richard Davidson insists on that. Those are skills. You, you can cultivate them. And the study of neuroscience to which I participated as a guinea pig and sometimes collaborator show that through neuroplasticity that if we train in anything, whether it's juggling, singing, or focused attention, compassion, you know, all this can be trained as skills and happiness as a cluster of qualities. There's no happiness center in the brain, but all those together gives more a positive effect all the time. You know, compassion is very, very constructive. Loving kindness is very positive effect. So if you cultivate those, then naturally you'll feel fine. But that yeah. needs to effort. That needs practice, not just like, you know, in three points. Someone told me, tell me the secret of happiness in 15 days and five points. I said, there's no such five points. There's no secret. It's not easy and it takes more than 15 days, but it's the best thing you can try to do and it's worth pursuing that all your life. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a wonderful answer. And, and I guess that's why it's called practice. You have to work at it and, and repeat it and uh, over and over to, for, for these. Well, I mean, we go 15 years to school and then do professional training. Why should it not be the, why should it not be the case for basic human quality? That would be yes. crazy to think yeah. differently. Right. So I, um, I, I wanted to save a few minutes for questions from the audience, if, if you agree. And we, we have a few questions that have come sure. in. And um, I invite any of you who are listening to add more questions. I don't think Matthew will have a chance to, to answer all of them, but hopefully a few of them. Um, so a first question is about reincarnation. Do you think that a culture that believes in reincarnation can sustain greater hope in hard times for living a better life than what a single life <laughs> without reincarnation presumably <laughs> as it west believes basically saying one misstep and you'll go to only one place and forever either up or down i guess um, <laughs> then what then one might well. say why not just act as you wish so to, to what extent would, does a does a belief in reincarnation um, have an impact on these questions well of course you know say you look at compassion and happiness so anyway that's the best way to spend your life, to be a good person, compassionate person. So then if you have many, many lives to come, it's even better because you are building up a very good future. So now this is of course a very, very culturally loaded issue. You know, in the East, it's very natural. In the West, if you sp uh, speak about that, people you are completely lunatic, basically, most of people. So, but actually, what does it come down to? is what is the nature of consciousness? So is consciousness 100% the workings of the brain? Now many neuroscientists think that, but none of them uh, has the enough confidence, they will all tell you, to say that they really, really know what consciousness is. This is the great uh, standing mystery, or let's say not complete mystery, but still one of the biggest uh, thing to study for neuroscience in this century. And nobody can pretend that we know everything about consciousness for the very reason first that, uh, you know, it's very complicated, the so-called soft and hard problem. So the hard problem is basically that you cannot step out of consciousness to learn about, to know about consciousness because everything for us start with being conscious to do science, to study the brain. You know, we already have consciousness. So it's very difficult to step out of something to study it and say, do we have it or not while using it all the time? So anyway, it's a very complex philosophical problem and it will be pretentious to say that we, everyone has solved that. So now if there is a possibility of some kind of continuity of consciousness, then of course, you know, it's like a stream. So there's no an individual, like a little nudget because there's no self identity, but there's a continuum of experience moment after moment that creates a special stream so it like, like the Ganga is different from the Mississippi, but there's no Mississippi entity. It's just a continuity, unbroken continuity. So if there's such thing like that, 
then obviously if you drop some medicinal plant in that M Mississippi River, then down the stream, you will find medicinal qualities. If you drop some cyanide, then it would be very dangerous to drink the water down there. So likewise, if you load your consciousness with hatred, arrogance, you know, craving and so forth, then you poison that stream and then you will experience what not being poisoned by cyanide, but unhappiness because that, that breeds unhappiness. So that's why in this life, and if it continues after, that's very so important to purify that stream of all those mental toxins, which basically hatred, you know, lack of discernment, craving, jealousy, envy, arrogance, there's you know, uh, uh, pride, there's so many or there's so many of those poisons. We in Buddhism we speak of 84,000 of them. So we need to, to get rid of all of them to get this inner freedom. And so that's uh, that's all the more important if you if that stream is going to go on. That's what I can say. And of course, for, for a Buddhist person like me, you no, know, I am doubt very much. I wish I could, but uh, we attend Buddhahood in this life. So if it was lost because I don't get, then it's, I better go to the beach and uh, you know take a, a good beer. Although I don't drink and I never drank in my life, but why should I make all this effort if we? if I fail to do it. <laughs> so I think if I, on the process of building something and, and you know, sort of being able to continue, then it's worth doing the best I can and then continue, continue, continue. So that's the Buddhist view. But as Saint Lama says, putting the Buddhist cap. So you know, sometimes <laughs> scientist cap, sometimes Buddhist cap. So anyway, that's because the question was asked, but... Um, it's a, it's a complicated subject, of course. Yes, yes, of course. Um, all right. Uh, two, I think we have time for maybe two more quick questions. One is about your morning ritual. What's your morning ritual? And can you share the best way, that, from your perspective, to start a day? So, top secret. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> so, well, basically, you know, of course, there's a lot of specific practices we do in Tibetan Buddhism. And we sort of uh, do a kind of recap of the whole part. So thinking of how oh, precious is human life. You know, we forget about that. How precious, incredible that we have this human existence. And then it's very fragile. You know, we may die any moment. You know, I'm going back after here. I may be <laughs> by a wild boar or something. I'm to walk in the forest. So anyway, I don't know. My life can stop my next breath. So I'm so lucky to be alive but it is fragile. So now if it's so precious and so fragile, then I should be very careful what I do, not build up unhappiness. I mean, we, there's a great sage, and Shantideva said, we aspire for happiness, but we turn our back to happiness. We want to avoid suffering, but we run to the sharp blade of the law of cause and effect. So there are things we need to accomplish, things we need to avoid, so the law of cause and effect. And then if we think we are going to find freedom and happiness by getting fame and wealth and beauty and, and all these things, it's not going to work. So the shortcoming of worldly preoccupation, though those we think about that, then we think who can help, what can help? So enlightenment is the only thing that is free from those things. And then is it just for myself? Well, that's a bit waste of time. So then we try to grow the wish, the altruistic wish, may I achieve Buddhahood so that I can become able to free all sentient beings, so the bodhicitta. Then I need to make provisions on the path so we accumulate so-called merit, and then I need to purify all my obscurations. Then I need to unite my little mind with the vast mind of the Buddha. So all those practice we do every day. And there's a long way to go. And then the specific practices, so that's, everyone's practitioner business. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't wanna keep you for too much longer. We told you we would only keep you for an hour, but I'll just end with a last very easy question that you can answer, I'm sure very quickly. And that is, what are your thoughts wow. on the fear of death? Do you think there's a way in which someone oh. come to an acceptance of death without anxiety? Last question. Yeah, I think I should be a bit more fearful now, 75. I better start getting really, really worried. But, you know, there's a saying, 
that in the beginning, when we think of that, we are like trapped wild animal. You know, it doesn't know whether he might save his life, lose his life. So it's terrible. Such a fear, incredible fear when you trap an animal. So then only think how to kind of get out of there. So that's what usually people, you know, fear that. Then if we practice and practice, we are like a, a farmer who did everything he or she could, you know, till the ground, take out the bad weeds and protect the crops and, you know, water them. And then, you know, who knows, there might be little droughts, maybe some insects or birds, but no regret. So we come to that with no regret. Mm -hmm. So I sort of like that myself. Then the best is we are so free and confident in our practice that when that comes, it's like a friend. I mean, not that we are so happy to die at all, but okay, hello, here you are. Okay, good, ready, let's go. So go while practicing. And then if you have the confidence and the, you had a wonderful teacher or you put your trust, then you can merge your mind in the, we say Buddhist practitioner can merge their mind with the absolute truth. And then like a little vase breaking and merging with the big space. So very good, no problem, but uh, I don't know. And that is, you know, I should be, not be arrogant. Maybe I'll be terrified. I don't know. Mm -hmm. When someone asked to his the Dalai Lama, he said, I'm very curious. Let's <laughs> see what happens. Yes, very good. Approach, approach it with curiosity, good advice. Um, yes. thank, you. Well. thank you. Thank you so much, Mathieu Ricard. This has been really a wonderful conversation. You've been very generous with your time and with your sharing your thoughts and, and um, experiences. And we really appreciate this gift you've given us. So thank you and bonne continuation. Most welcome. And hello to our French friend and other friends. Yes. Other friends. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. Okay, I, I hope I can come to Columbia University once in the in, you, in person. You are let's welcome. see. You're welcome. I did, I did come in the past. I forgot to, which circumstances. <laughs> okay. Thank you okay. so much. And thank you, Fanny, for Take joining care. us. Thanks all of you for being here. Good night. Take care. Bye bye. bye.